Astronomers believe that the universe started as just a single point. They call it the singularity. A point of infinite density and gravity. This gravitational singularity contained all the energy and space-time of the universe. Then it exploded, in what modern science refers to as, the Big Bang. The singularity expanded to grow as large as it is right now. And it continues to grow. In the mythology of Lost, the source is the focal point of our existence. It is not just the beating heart of the island, but of all living things. It burns bright, deep down beneath the crust of the earth. So, if the source is the origin of all consciousness, and the reason for why everything is the way it is, that means it can be tied directly to the idea of the singularity and the Big Bang. To the origin of the universe and space-time itself. The source wasn't just forged in the fire of creation. The source, is, the fire of creation itself. It is perhaps within the inner core of our planet where the source thrives. We can only really comprehend this energy from a human being's perception of three-dimensional reality. It's why we only see the energy as a bright, blinding light. But we know that this light is actually operating within a fourth-dimensional space. A space that we refer to as time itself. The electromagnetic energy is what made the formation of all life possible. By bringing fourth-dimensional consciousness into this three-dimensional space. Like the beating heart of a living organism. Or, the power center inside a machine. The writers originally planned for the source to be located in the heart of a volcano, which was alluded to in Season 3 episode, The Man Behind the Curtain. Yes. Is that what happened to the volcano on this island? Exactly, Annie, but that was a long time ago. Okay, let's get ourselves an eruption. Oh, cool. Situation right. Just add water and voila. However, after being constricted by the studio's budget limitations, they had to change the location to a cave. But this piece of trivia tells us a lot. The showrunners originally intended the origin of existence itself to lie within a dormant volcano. Which suggests that they had thought about the very beginnings of the source in terms of the planet's formation. We know that the source is not just one single pocket of light in a single location. It has connective tentacles of energy that spread out beneath planet's crust, like veins and arteries connected to a heart. As continents and sea beds formed on Earth, the source's pockets of electromagnetism were buried at various depths. Hidden beneath the surface by Earth, or water. These geological hotspots can still be found, and felt. Although most of them appear to reside underneath the ocean, water might be the crucial element that keeps the light cool. We know that the source can overheat and release large bursts of radiation. We also know that this energy can burn itself out. Perhaps, because the light is buried beneath earth and water, it prevents our world from returning to that uninhabitable volcanic, magma planet it started out as. There are several locations we know of where these geological hotspots can be found on land. The first is based in Tunisia, what Charles Widmore referred to as the exit. Another location is in the Australian outback, beneath Isaac of Uluru's camp, in which he harnesses the energy in order to heal the sick. And another confirmed location is beneath the Lamp Post Station in Los Angeles. There are surely many more hotspots that we never see. The point is, the source is connected directly to these places in a subterranean way. This energy resides so deep in the earth that we could not realistically reach it simply from digging up the ground. The only place this energy can be properly accessed is where it is most concentrated. The island. Presumably, the showrunners based the idea of these geological hotspots on the pseudo-scientific idea of a vile vortex. These vortices are supposed to be anomalic regions, distributed across the Earth, where disproportionately many strange phenomena occur, such as disappearances and miscellaneous types of paranormal activity. Some claim that the Bermuda Triangle is one of these alleged areas. If you look at the map of these theoretical vile vortices, they do resemble the lamp post's depiction of electromagnetic hotspots. And it is these very specific hotspots that offer up a variety of possible teleportation points for the island to move to. There are two types of ways that the island is known to move between these points. The first is a naturally occurring, seemingly random jump from one location to another, presumably dictated by the island's own will. The second way in which the island moves happens when the wheel is turned, ergo, the island is moved by people rather than itself. Before we address naturally occurring movement, let's look more closely at the wheel and hypothesize what exactly is happening when it gets pushed. 
The man in black describes the system his people are building as channeling water with the light. Theoretically, this system is not too dissimilar to how a water wheel works. A water wheel is a machine that converts the energy of flowing water into useful forms of power. Such wheels are usually constructed from wood or metal, with a number of blades or buckets arranged on the outside rim to form the driving car. Here are some diagrams of the possible systems that the donkey wheel is activating behind that stone wall. The wheel is pushed, activating the flow of water. This flow is presumably being channeled into the wheel chamber from a natural water source. As the wheel rotates, the water is circulated through the corridor of light, creating a circulatory effect. But this is working in direct opposition to the natural flow of water around the island. Look at the river stream that organically feeds into the cave of light. This is before there ever was a cork, and before there ever was a wheel. The stream flowed down the throat of the cave and directly into the open aperture of the source. Then presumably flowed back out again at another location on the island. The flow of this stream into the light is like a bloodstream pumping its way into an artery. Like a naturally occurring circulatory system. It appears that the water stabilized the core of the source and, therefore, our existence. Both in fourth dimensional and three dimensional spaces. This balance was disrupted following the ancient incident. And this created the need for the metaphorical heart surgery, as described in Chapter 23 on the Egyptian period. The donkey wheel synthesizes this process by channeling water into a pocket of light and refracting it back. And it is doing so completely unnaturally. This is a violation of the laws of nature. You cannot reroute the bloodstream of the island without consequences to its heart. So, the island reacts with, what is described best as, a space-time spasm. To protect the fourth-dimensional gateway in the cave, the island moves to another geological hotspot in space-time. As the main body teleports, it ejects the intruder responsible for causing this violation, as if they were a foreign object or an infection. After all, there is a reason that the others believe that someone who pushes that wheel must then be banished. Think about why that rule exists. Because using the wheel is viewed as an offense to the island and its natural state of being. The creation of the chamber is historically viewed as an offense. A shameful chapter in the island's history. And just like the smoke monster's summoning chamber being walled off beneath the temple grounds, so too was the donkey wheel chamber buried. This is why, before Dharma arrived on the island, the well was filled in. At the time, this was probably the only known access point to reach the wheel chamber. The others buried this place intentionally. So, why was the wheel chamber frozen when Ben used it? There are several possibilities for the ice buildup, including more science-heavy explanations such as changing magnetic fields that cause temperature shifts. However, this channel takes the view that if the water system behind the wall isn't used for a long period of time, it begins to cool. Gradually, this increasingly cold and stagnate water will refrigerate the chamber. We know that the wheel had not been used, presumably since the Dharma days, which explains why the chamber had grown so chilly. And this is why Ben has to de-ice the wheel. He struggles to push the spokes because its central rotation mechanism is still frozen, and it needs to revolve in order to open up the old water runoff. Ben has to break the ice, literally. As the old runoff activates, it channels the water into the energy pocket, as discussed. Now, let's discuss how and why the island moves of its own accord. It is entirely possible that the island didn't always automatically move from place to place. If the island's original location was somewhere in the Mediterranean, that would have made it accessible to many cultures that eventually made it their home. Imagine that the island is located right smack in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. This would have made it discoverable by both the Egyptians and the Romans, as well as other cultures that predate them. Such as explorers from ancient Mesopotamia, now known as Iraq. This being the original location of the island also means that its nearest geological hotspot beyond its own bubble was, none other than, Tunisia, a neighboring energy pocket within close proximity to the source. Think of it like a bridge. Whenever the source needed to transport someone, or something, off its shores, they were transported through the same fourth-dimensional corridor. This channel posits the theory that the island only started moving from place to place, after, the wheel was first turned by the Egyptians, and following the ancient incident. The island started shifting in space at seemingly random intervals as a defense mechanism. This was a direct consequence of violating the natural flow of energy around the island. The question that needs to be asked now is this. If the island is always moving location, why isn't there a more obvious shift for the people on the island? 
After all, the island sometimes moves from one side of the planet to the other, so surely there would be the equivalent of a vivid jump cut from day to night every once in a while. Well, this is where Daniel Faraday's payload test from Season 4 episode, The Economist, comes into play. We know that the island is surrounded by a magnetic field. A bubble, or, as Desmond calls it, a giant snow globe. It's the same energy field that makes the frozen donkey wheel maintain its own little pocket of time. Within this bubble, time can either move slower, or faster, than the rest of the world. Or it can even stand totally still. As long as you are within this bubble, the rules of linear time do not apply. When the island shifts from one location to another, the people on the island cannot see beyond this bubble of time. For example, it could be night time in the South Pacific, but still daylight within the island bubble as it teleports from somewhere in the Mediterranean. After it moves, the island will slowly sync up with its surrounding environment. No one within the bubble will notice the change or sense of inertia. Basically, there is a lag. The snow globe needs to adjust to its new location and catch up with real-world time. The only disorientating change that island inhabitants might experience with this shift is a sudden, drastic change in weather patterns once the lag catches up with the environment. This lag is demonstrated on several occasions throughout the show. It is why Frank Lapidus can take off from the island at dusk, fly for a few minutes, then land on the freighter in the middle of the day. It is why the Kahana's doctor can wash up on the shores of the island before he is killed outside of the bubble. And it is why Daniel's payload rockets are out of sync with one another. For the majority of Season 4, the Kahana freighter is fairly close to the edge of this electromagnetic bubble. Therefore, it will have smaller time discrepancies with these lags. Sometimes by minutes, sometimes by hours. Sometimes by at least half a day, to 24 hours. So, it follows that the further away you get from the island snow globe, the less that time will cohere and sync up precisely. In general relativity, differences in gravity between locations can cause time to flow at different rates. This idea is demonstrated in the film Interstellar. Example, the astronauts land on a water planet and are there for no more than an hour or two, only to see many years pass back on Earth. Of course, the difference between time on the island and time in the real world is not so vast. There seem to be smaller variations, depending on where the island is and how long it has been since it moved. Unlike Interstellar, once you leave this field of gravity, you catch up to real world time even if you lose or gain days in between. The Oceanic Six are rescued by Penny's boat, the Searcher, and we have mostly been following their internal clock of how many days have passed between the crash on September 22nd and now. According to Lostpedia, the date of their rescue by Penny is approximately December 31, 2004. But the Oceanic Six spend another week aboard that boat getting their cover story straight, and syncing up the timeline with what the world knows. Their cover story might also have included plugging up some time discrepancies. Admittedly, these conversations are never seen nor referenced, so this remains pure speculation. But we know that time on the island moves very differently to that of time on the outside world, due to the electromagnetic bubble and time dilation. This must impact the internal clocks of people who live on the island after they leave. It would be like the worst jet lag in history. Think about it this way. The very fact that the island was jumping into different time zones around the world would mean that our losties internal body clocks were going to be wrong in terms of what time of day it really was. There is no practical way that the way their measurement of the days, and their sense of time, was the same as ours. This might help to explain how Tom Friendly could leave the island during a short window of time in Season 3, between the events of Stranger in a Strange Land and Par Avion. It is during this window in which he returns to America and recruits Michael Dawson, who appears to have been back home for some time now. However, according to the on-island timeline, Tom is gone for no longer than five days, while Michael has only been back home for a week. Your perception of how long your friends have been gone, it's not necessarily how long they've actually been gone. What does that mean? This is a mistake. Charlotte's right. This is complicated stuff. The further away people get from the island bubble and its time dilation anomaly, the more that linear Earth time starts to run normally for them again. Meanwhile, time continues to unfold at different rates back on the island. Sometimes more slowly, such as after the island has been moved. Or it moves faster as it races to catch up to its new location's time.
So, Tom friendly taking the submarine to visit the mainland in this short window of island time suddenly becomes more plausible, as does the state of Michael's life. We can only speculate as to how often the island independently moves during the course of the show. We can assume that it teleports itself when there is a spike or blip in the light beneath the landmass. In season 1, the island almost certainly moves after Desmond resets the button and the plane crashes. Not only was the plane off course, but the survivors were now in a totally different geographic location. After season 2's fail-safe detonation, the island no doubt moves again. The swan's energy pocket is destroyed, prompting the island to jump location. This giant burst of electromagnetic energy, and the island teleporting across the planet to a new hotspot, gets captured by Penelope Widmore's team at a tracking station. Presumably somewhere in Antarctica, the two Portuguese men stationed there are monitoring for anomalies in the magnetic fields of the Earth. The North Pole is perfectly positioned to monitor the Earth's magnetic field for unusual electrical behavior, or disturbances in the ionosphere. What these men are doing is not too dissimilar to what Dharma did with the lamp post station in Los Angeles. It is totally reasonable to assume that this location in the North Pole, if it is indeed the North Pole, is another geological pocket connected to the source. The island does not move naturally again until after Ben turns the wheel in 2004. We know this because both Penelope and her father, Charles, managed to roughly locate the island soon after the fail-safe event. Once Ben pushes the wheel, the island physically jumps to a new location, where it presumably stays until 2007. Meanwhile, the predestined time travelers, such as John Locke, shift backwards through time to fulfill their respective destinies in the past. Richard Alpert and the others remain in the present, and await the return of John Locke. We can assume that they live in a state of readiness until that day comes. The others are nothing if not patient. The homecoming of John Locke happens to coincide precisely with the next natural movement of the island, which Eloise Hawking precisely calculated at the lamppost. As a Jira 316 hits the edge of the electromagnetic bubble, the source rips Jack, Kate, Saeed and Hurley out of their seats, and transports them back to where they belong in the past. But what do we see happen to the Ajira flight and the other passengers? The plane is sucked into the gravitational pull of the island and into the snow globe. Hence, why Ajira goes from flying through the middle of the evening sky into a bright sunny day inside this bubble. Either Ajira has arrived in yesterday, or they have jumped forward to tomorrow. Once again, this is proof that time inside the island bubble is flowing at a completely different rate to the external world. The island has teleported to the Western Pacific from an unknown previous location. Wherever that previous place was, it was almost certainly daylight there. By the time Frank and Son are traveling from Hydra over to the main island, the bubble is catching up with the surrounding environment of its new geographical hotspot. Because this time dilation is always shifting, it is hard to know when exactly we are, in terms of real-world time. The measurements for time that people have within this snow globe will always be somewhat relative. These time anomalies are perhaps the side effects of the fourth dimensional core at the heart of the island, and indeed, at the core of our entire planet and existence. The island seems to move through space-time in order to protect itself when threatened, and so that predestined travelers may find its shores and their predetermined destinies when the timing is right. And we know that, eventually, time catches up to everyone. And everything. Thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to see more videos. Until the next time, stay lost.